world to tell you is that, um, what's that? What Ryan failed to tell you is that there is biblical evidence that iPhones, Apple products are connected with the mark of the beast in Revelation. I'm just putting that out there, right? Lest you Apple users like, <laughs> that's why Apple copies everything Android's been doing the past couple of years. I'm just saying, just saying. Let's not. Let's let's on, we'll throw down tomorrow. Okay, Obadiah, turn there if you would. Obadiah, 21 verses nestled in the Old Testament, the shortest book of the minor prophets, shortest book of the Old Testament. But don't mistake its length or its brevity as a, as a message that doesn't matter, that's not important, that is not, that is not uh, relevant to our day today. Isaiah, 21 verses. Verse 1, the vision of Obadiah. Thus says the Lord God concerning Edom. We have heard a report from the Lord, and an envoy has been sent among the nations, saying, Arise and let us go against her for battle. Behold, I will make you a small, small among nations, for you are greatly despised. The arrogance of your heart has deceived you, you who live in the, of the rock and the loftiness of the falling place, who, your heart, who will bring me down to earth? Though you build high like an eagle, though you at your nest among the stars, for there I bring you down, declares the Lord. If thieves come to you, if robbers by night, oh, how will you be ruined? Would they not steal only until they had enough? If grape gatherers come, would they not leave some gleanings? Oh, Esau, how you, uh, oh, Esau, you will be ransacked and his treasure, hidden treasure searched, searched out. All the men allied with you will send you forth to the border, and the men at peace with you will deceive you and overpower you. They eat your bread. They will sit in am No understanding in him. Will I not on that day, declares the Lord, destroy wise men from Edom, understanding from the mountain of Esau? Then your mighty men will be dismayed, old Teman, in order that everyone may be cut off from the mountain of Esau by slaughter. Because of the brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame, and you will be cut off forever. On that day you stood aloof. On that day the strangers carried off his wealth and the foreigners entered his gate and cast lots for Jerusalem and you were as one of them. Do not gloat over your brother's day, the day of his... Do not rejoice over the sons of Judah in the day of their destruction. Yes, do not boast in the day of their distress. Do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their... Do, do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster, and do not loot their wealth in the day of their disaster. And do not stand at the fork of the road to cut down their fugitives and not imprison their survivors in the day of their distress. The day of the Lord draws near on all nations. As you have done, it will be done to you. Your dealings will return on your own head. Because just as you drank on my holy mountain, will drink continually and they will drink and swap and become as if they have never existed. But on Mount Zion there will be those who escape and it will be holy. And the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. Then the house of Jacob will be a fire and the house of Joseph a flame. But the house of Esau will be as stubble and they will set them on fire and consume them so that there will be no survivor of the house of Esau. For the Lord has spoken. Then those of the Negev will possess the mountain of Esau, and those of the Shephelah, the Philistine plain, they will possess the territory of Ephraim, the territory of Samaria, and Benjamin will possess Gilead, and the exiles of this host of the sons of Israel, who are among the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, and the exiles of Jerusalem who are in Shephard, will possess the cities of the Negev. The deliverers will ascend Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom will be the Lord's. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Perhaps of all the huge conflicts that exist, there are none more painful 
and difficult to resolve than those between blood relatives. If you're here and you've had conflict with a family member, blood, kin, you know how difficult those seasons can be. I have a history, not, not a long list, but a, I look back even within my own family, I can remember at a young age conflict taking place in not only my home, but in the surrounding homes of my family members. I remember long drawn out battles between parents, between parents and children, between cousins, between aunts and uncles. I remember long drawn out conflicts, so much so that they instilled so much damage that it ruined those relationships even to this day. I remember times growing up where there was an awkwardness at family and eventually that awkwardness because of the conflict gave way to not seeing those family members at all. How I saw as a young person this lack of fighting for peace, reconciliation, working things out between family members. And even to this day, reflecting on this history, it pains me to realize that even people, grown men and women, adults, can't seem to work through the difficulties that have arisen in those relationships. And even as I got older, my adults, having experienced conflict between family members being the worst thing, being one of the most difficult things, and yet with God's help and by God's grace, trying to work through those difficulties with people who are related to you. And yet, though peace has been discovered in some of those things, it has never returned to where it originally was. There's been a damage as a result of that conflict. Have you been there before? You relate with having difficulty with family members and, and again, painful, heart-wrenching. And yet God calls us to resolve those relationships. Though those are painful situations, perhaps even more tragic are the conflicts that arise in national between men and women who would call themselves Americans. Think about the worst war that has ever taken place in our own country, and we think about the Civil War. Brother against brother. And still today, it remains one of the bloodiest wars, the one war that has taken out more American lives than any other war that has ever happened. And we reflect back and go, how could we ever arrive at this place as a country? We think about our families there, but we think about the tragedy of, of brother fighting against brother. And perhaps nothing reflects the brokenness of our world than that kin perpetrating atrocities upon one another. And we look back with shame. We look back with disgust. And yet we have to realize that there's something about our relationships not just with our family, not just with our blood, not just with our kin, but our relationships with one another. And we arrive at what I believe are some important points that we're going to draw today out of Obadiah on this topic. Because at the heart of the conflict, at the heart of all these difficulties lies pride. Pride is that ingredient that that has been introduced into the human race that has caused disunity and division and discord like none other. It is the mother hen of all sins. That's what C.S. Lewis called it. John Edwards, one of the greatest minds ever produced in America, said pride was the first sin introduced into the human race and it will be ultimately the last sin uprooted at the end of time. And yet it's something that we cannot just gloss over. Something that we should not treat lightly. It's not something we should treat delicately. Because this is the issue at the heart of Obadiah. Notice in Obadiah, 
verse 2, verse 3, the Lord is very clear in pointing out, verse 3, the arrogance of your heart has deceived you. There is the problem. And most of us are taught the ways of humility. It comes much more natural to stick up for what we believe, to stick up for our rights. And in doing that, we ruin relationships. And at the core of pride is the fact that we ruin our relationship with the Almighty God who has told us he will not tolerate rivals. And yet that's what pride does, doesn't it? It tells us that we can make better choices than God. We can rely on better resources than Him. That we've got greater wisdom than He has. Or we have uh, better strength than He offers. The Bible is clear when it comes to pride. And yet, in understanding the message of Obadiah and what he has to say about pride, we've got to talk a little bit about history, which is the first point in your notes this morning, the history of hostility and conflict. Because what you're going to see, and and, and unless we understand this, we're not going to understand the message of Obadiah. So we're going to get historical. I love history. I'm a history major from ASU. Go Sun Devils. I love history. And history, if we don't learn from it, we're doomed to repeat it. So we go back 100 years, 800 years to be exact, to the story of two brothers named Jacob and Esau. These guys were marked for conflict at the very start. So much so, they were fighting in their mother's womb. Go back to Genesis 25. It says that the Lord is going to appoint Jacob over Esau, even though Esau would be the firstborn and the inheritor of the birthright. God said, I will choose Jacob over Esau, and Esau will bow to Jacob, which was unheard of in this culture, but it just shows us the sovereign control of God, that oftentimes God does things that defies explanation, that goes against our cultural norms. He chooses Jacob, and there was even in the mother's womb, so so that when the babies were born, Esau came out first and Jacob was holding on to his heel. That's why they call him the heel grabber. And their life was marked with constant strife and animosity. If you have siblings, you probably relate with Jacob and Esau. If you've had children, you know the squabbling and the conflict that can exist between children. The problem was exacerbated by the parents who are Rebekah and Isaac. Rebekah chose to show favor to Jacob, while Isaac chose to show favor to Esau. Parents, lesson number one, don't play favorites with your kids. All right? Jokingly in my house, sometimes I'll say, today you want to know who my favorite child is? But my kids know I'm joking because I want to show them love equally. But they played favorites. Rebecca chose to honor one over the other, and Jacob chose, or Isaac chose to honor the other over the other, and thus conflict ensued. And in chapter 27 of Genesis, rather than trusting God's timetable, Rebecca and Jacob schemed to get the birthright from their dad. Dad was losing eyesight. They a plan where Jacob would put on a a coat of animal fur because his brother was a little hairier than he was and because of their dad's limited eyesight, would go and say, Dad, it's me, Esau, feel my arm. And he felt the animal fur, thinking it was his son's skin, Esau, and gave the birthright, he thought, to Esau, but through their deception was really Jacob. See, nothing ever good comes through scheming. Good always comes through trusting. But this sent a trajectory intensified conflict between the two brothers. Once Esau heard Jacob had stolen what was his by birth, he vowed to kill his brother. Jacob heard of his intentions and fled, and never the two would have peaceful reconciliation again. There was a moment in in Genesis chapter 32 where they came together briefly, but after that, they would never come together. There was a moment in Genesis 35 where they buried their dad, but the problem in burying their father, they never buried the hostility between the two of them. Jacob became the father of a nation we will call Israel. Esau of a nation we will call Edom. 
two men knowing full well the, the devastation of hostility and conflict would never have peace between the two of them. They then give birth to two nations that are constantly at war with one another. You read throughout the Old Testament that these two nations did not like each other. So much so, a few hundred years later during the time of Moses, the exodus of Israel out of Egypt took place and they came to the land of Edom. They asked Edom permission to pass through that they would even pay for the water that they drank and gave to their animals. And the king of Edom said, no. Again, indicative of the lack of peace between these two nations. And then ultimately these two nations would result in a spiritual message of two kingdoms that we're going to talk about at the very end of this message. But you need to understand this relationship before you understand. Edom's message comes 800 years after the tale of Jacob and Esau. What's going to happen now is the Babylonians are going to come in, led by a guy named Nebuchadnezzar, and they're going to ransack Israel. The problem is, Edom is going to watch this happen and not step in to help their blood relatives. As a matter of fact, their response is anything but God honoring and God glorifying. Which brings us to our second point that we're going to spend some time to unpack. See at the beginning of Obadiah the heart of pride and confidence. And what I mean by confidence is this. When you place your security and trust in something that will ultimately fail. That is no good confidence at the end of the day. There's a pride that we can take in things and there's a confidence that can come in that pride which ultimately will lead to our downfall. So here's what I want you to notice. Five things that Edom, the descendants of Esau, put their trust in. And the five things are these. Number one, they are proud of their geography. Secondly, they are proud of their prosperity. Third, they're proud of their diplomacy. Number three, four, they're proud of their philosophy and of their military. First nine verses. We'll go back if you miss any of those blanks. I know some of you are like, diploma, what? what? We'll go back. Write down these verses if you would. I'm going to throw some verses at you that aren't here but are helpful to our, our examination of what God's trying to get to us here. So the heart of of this conflict is pride. Scholars tell us that when they examine the people of Edom, the Edom, that there is no trace of any sort of divinity in their culture. Which is very odd for the culture. So you have these anthropologists going out studying people groups. And what anthropologists usually discover is that there's some spiritual component, that there's a deity, there's some sort of God at the center of the culture that these people depend on and then they look to. Edom is a rarity in that they have not found any sort of divine being that they are dependent to. Which tells us the level of their pride. They're so self-sufficient they are so self-satisfied that they have no need for anything or anyone beyond themselves. And yet God tells us in Proverbs chapter 16, verse 5, that everyone who is arrogant in their heart is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 16, verse 18 says, Pride goes before destruction. In the New Testament, James chapter 4 Six tells us that God is opposed to the proud. And literally that word opposed means he's leveraging a military army to stand against such aggressiveness. See, why is this such an important topic? Is because pride dethrones God and replaces man upon that position that only God should occupy. And the problem with man 
you and I, humankind, is that we don't want to submit to a higher authority. We don't want to submit to a greater authority. We think we've got... We're the ones driving around in our cars with the bumper stickers that say, hey, God's my co-pilot. You know, he's there when we need him. We can pull him out when, when he's useful. But you know what? Other than that, I've got this. Oh, God bless Carrie Underwood. Jesus, take the wheel. Jesus, take that wheel, right? I say that facetiously and because Jacob's not here. <laughs> so, pride is dangerous because even in the early history of humankind, go back to Adam and Eve, it was the serpent that God, you can be like God. What, what are you doing? tree over there? The one he told you not to eat from? He's all doing it because you're going to be like him when you eat it. So do you want to submit to him or do you want to be like him? And they're like, well, okay, sounds good. And they eat. And their eyes are open. They realize the destruction that now has fallen upon the human spirit, the human emotions, the human psyche, the experience in general. See, God when dethroned, leaves us nothing to a path of destruction. When God is dethroned, there is nothing promising but destruction. This is the message to Edom. This has been the message to Edom for 100 years. This is the message not just Edom, but all the surrounding nations. And not only all the surrounding nations of Israel, but to Israel itself. This is a problem... An epidemic that exists within the heart of man that must be dealt with because the problem is we are finding so much confidence and so much security in other things other than God. Can you sit there and honestly say your full confidence is in the Lord and the Lord alone? Can I tell you that's a battle that I have to win in my own heart? Because there's times I sit there and I look and I go, oh, I got health. God, I'm good. Oh, I've got enough money in my bank account. I'm set. I got two cars that run. Woohoo, hallelujah. And I look at my life, and I've set up my life in such a way that really God doesn't need to do it. Because according to my own wisdom and my own plan, I'm set. What, what, have I got to, what have I got to be concerned about? And I'm going to tell you, this message is important for our culture because of any culture in the world, we are the ones that I believe are the most self-deceived. Because right, the right guy's in office, right? We're set. Oh, the right laws are being passed. We're good. Oh man, there's peace in our country. Things are, they, you know, there's, there's a little racism going on over here. That, that's okay. That will take, it's not in my neighborhood. Right? It's on my, it's on my community. We'll, let, we'll pray for them. Hope they all work it out. But we're good in our little, little bubble, aren't we? And we can sit back and grow a little bit too confident and too comfortable because guess what? All the I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, and there's really nothing to be concerned about. And this is the place where God says, because of that attitude, you ought to be the most concerned. Because it doesn't matter where you live. doesn't matter how much wealth you've accumulated. doesn't mean who's your friends, who's in your circle, what are your, what are your allies, who are they, can it be trusted. It doesn't matter how much wisdom you have, what kind of degrees you have. I mean, I've got a Master's of Divinity degree. I'm a Master of the Universe. <laughs> what do I got to lose, Right? I can talk circles around you guys when it comes to topics of theology and philosophy. Oh, peasants. <laughs> We've got a strong military base. Who's going to even try to make war with us? We're... And yet God says, lie, 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 lie. Deceive, deceive, deceive deceived. Jesus kind of nodded to this thought when he said to the rich man, 
accumulated so much stuff for himself. He had to big builder, build bigger And yet, when his soul was to be called and accounted for, he had nothing of substance to present to the Lord. He was empty when it came to the things that were most significant. And Jesus says in that amazing parable, he says, you've gained the whole world, but you've lost your You've been so prideful in the way you've lived your life, walking around like you're the cock of the walk, looking down on everybody else. Yet when the very thing that's required of you comes up empty, what is there to boast about in that day? Do you see how insidious pride can be? You see how we should never take it for granted? And that the, the pride that exists within all of our hearts should be uprooted and replaced by that fruit of the Spirit called humility, realizing that every single day we should thank God for our health, that we should thank God for our possessions, the fact that He has allowed us to have electricity and good running water, and, and that we're not in a, in a context in which people are just killing each other needlessly. There's not rampant violence and chaos. And we can list all those blessings, and at the end of the day, nothing has been given to you that has not come through the gracious hand of God. You think you are you think you're responsible for all the synapses in your brain to make you smart to get the master of the universe degree? You think you're wise enough to go up and to become the salesman you are? At the end of the day, we take everything in the context of, wow, who am I? God, you're good. You're good. You're awesome. And, and with an attitude of humility, God is there on the throne as a king telling his, his subjects, I love you. I want what's best for you. And I want you to receive everything I've given to you as a gift. And I never want you to hoard it. And I never want you to have confidence in it. I never want you to find your security there. I never want you to find your significance there. All these things are evidence of a greater love that you should find your all in me. A relationship. And yet pride has entered the human race, and into our context of living and every day whispering, you don't need God. And I say that because today you're saying, rah, rah, yay God! And tomorrow you're going to wake up and you're going to live your life as a practical atheist. You want me to be gracious? Okay, you'll make it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you'll be a practical atheist. Because there will be something that happens, something that you'll think about, something that you will be involved in, that you will just forget about God, because guess what? You just don't need Him. There's not that dependence. There's not that reliance. We're good. And God says, pride goes before destruction. Think about what they were prideful of. Look at verses 3 and 4. It talks about they had these, this, they lived in this area of the Middle East that was like a fortress. It was like these big, tall, craggy, rocky cliffs. And I'm going I'm to tell you, the place where this is located is the same place where Indiana Jones in the last crusade op- ended up looking for the Holy Grail. Who saw? Come on, Indiana Jones. You are un-American if you've never seen Indiana Jones. Raiders of the Lost Ark, one of the greatest action movies ever. Temple of Doom in the Ark, but then Last Crusade. Right? They're looking for the Holy Grail. And if you remember, they rode in horseback down that very narrow chasm to the city of Petra. This is Edom. So, you want to talk about geography? Well, they were set as far as the location because it was easily defendable. There was a group of a dozen soldiers that could sit and ward off a hundred plus of an opposing army because of the narrowness of the canyons. So, they were like, we're set. Who's going to come in? I mean, they didn't have repelling gear back then. There weren't these guys like coming down the coast, like, look out, here they come, the Navy SEAL. You know, there wasn't any of 
But it was an easily defensible, impregnable, fortress-like environment, and they took pride in it. It's like when you see those, those birds, like he talks about making nests in those high places, and you sit there and go, wow, how do they get up there? We could never get up there. I'd love to see what's in that little nest, but it's so far up in the craggy cliffs. What? And God says, don't be amazed and find confidence in your secure position because God says, I will bring you down. So they took pride in their, their geography. Secondly, they took pride in their prosperity. They existed on a very wealthy trade route called the King's Highway. Numbers chapter 20, you can read more about this. But they were in such an incredible position that they were able to, to barter with trade routes that went all over that region of the world. And they picked up a wonderful commodities. They were able to, to not only pick up incredible commodities, they were able to trade commodities, such as the things that came out of the mountains, copper and other minerals. And they were wealthy, and they're sitting there going, we've got it made. We're, we're, in defense, we're defensible as far as a fortress. We've got as much money as we want. And God says, in Obadiah, verses 5, and the thieves come to you. And usually when thieves break into a house, they leave something behind. They don't take everything. I had a family member whose house was broken into. There was still stuff left after the thieves had taken some stuff. And then he talks about the grape others uh, In the Old Testament, when you gathered grapes and harvested grapes, you never gathered 100% of all the, the, the produce. You always left something behind so that community could come in and pick up what was left. God says to Edom, when destruction comes, there will be nothing left. You will lose it all. Lest you take pride in your prosperity, lest you find security in wealth, God says, what does it profit to you if you gain the whole world yet lose your soul? They took pride in Look at verse 6, 7. All the men that are allied with you. Well, guess what? Those allies, those, those treaties that you entered into with surrounding nations, they're going to turn on you. Have you ever had a friend betray you? Have you ever had somebody you thought was in your corner and all of a sudden it's like a and hide? They took, there is something empty about that feeling. That you put so much trust, so much faith in that relationship. God says to Edom, all those people that you surrounded yourself thinking they're going to look after you, they're going to turn on you. As a matter of fact, they're going to go to war against you. Because isn't that what pride does in our relationships? We use people as far as they can benefit us. And when they are no longer able to benefit us, we drop them. You think that's a healthy way? To, to live our relationships? Don't you, do you think we do that with God? As far as God is able to help me, I'm going to use him. But the moment he doesn't do anything, for me, you know, it's like that, what have you done for me lately? You know, I'm not going to go into it. The dancing, and is that Janet Jackson? God, I love her. We, we go to God with that song, like, you know, what have you done for me lately? Oh God, look at how much you've done for me. You know, I love you, I love you, I love you. And then the moment he doesn't do anything for you, it's like, you know what, I, I'm done with him. And how that trickles into our relationships. See, we no longer live relationships where it's like, what can I do for you with nothing expected in return? Married couples, pay attention. If you have any expectation on your spouse that ultimately only God will fulfill, your relationship will be devastating. Let me say it again. We enter into relationships. And part of the human condition is that we expect things from that relationship. And the reason relationships have difficulty is because we expect things from that relationship that only God can give. And how dare we put that person in the position of God. I had a girlfriend once tell me, sorry honey, I think you know about this story, but cover your ears. This was before Lori, obviously, right? <laughs> 
I, have a, I had a relationship with this girl in high school. And we were young in our faith, and we were trying to honor God in our lives. And, and uh, I just one day I just said to her, I said, how is your relationship with God? How are you doing in this area? And she says, Scott, you are my God. It's good knowing you. Like the moment we put each other on those pedestals and expect, it's like, this thing, it's like two starving ticks on a dead dog. It is not going to go anywhere. This is not going to work. We, we go to him who is the bread of life. We go to him who is the living water. We go to him who is the life, the truth, the way. We go to him who is more than sufficient to give what we need. And yet we forget him and now we put each other on that place of God and the moment you don't deliver, I drop you. They're proud of their philosophy. Because they lived on the king's highway, there are traders coming from the, the land of the east where there is incredible the incredible wisdom being exchanged. Matter of fact, one of Job's friends, Eliphaz, was from Edom. And you know, he was full of wisdom. It was wrong wisdom, but he was full of wisdom. And so we have this idea that they, they prop themselves up saying, man, we know the, the basic rules of argumentation. We have theories that can make sense of the world. And you could sit down and Kind of like that scene from Princess Bride. You know, you sit there and go, Plato, Socrates, morons. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> They're proud of their military. Oh, there's more. Trust me. This is going to, this is going to get fun. They're proud of their military. See, he says, I'm going to destroy the wise. Your mighty men will be dismayed. Everyone will be cut off and ultimately slaughtered. See the things they put their faith in, their security in, their confidence in. And God says, that is misdirected. These are fine things in themselves, but when they replace the central role of God, they will not deliver. They don't make the promises God makes. And God says to Edom, you have been warned. Judgment is coming, and if you think you can stand strong by having all this stuff possessed and gathered and presented to me, God is not impressed. Because when you're in a plane, and that plane's going down, whether you're Bill Gates, whether you're Mother Teresa, whether you're a five-year-old child, you go down without God, you all die an equal death before the holy God I love and worship. Position? Degree, pedigree, heritage, legacy, you name it. It does not matter. God intends for these things to be wonderful gifts, but you are not to forget the giver in light of the gifts. Here's the question. Where are you placing security? Where are you placing your confidence? Where are you placing your faith? Because God says to us today, like he said to Edom of old and throughout the whole entire corpus of scripture, only he offers eternal life. Only he offers everlasting hope. And only in him can you at the end of the day have true security. Where is your faith today? Point number three. The heart of pride and confidence will ultimately result in how we, we treat one another in our relationships. And I've mentioned a couple already, but the main argument God has against Edom is that they turn to indifference and violence against their own blood brothers. Four things I want you to notice in verses 10 through 16. That they were guilty of the sin of ignoring they were guilty of the sin of rejoicing. They were guilty of the sin of assisting. And they were guilty of the sin of rejecting. Ignoring, rejoicing, assisting, rejecting. Pride in our hearts will lead to war. 
Pride in our hearts will lead to violence. Pride in our hearts will lead to the dehumanizing of other people standing in the way of our own ambitions. If you forget about God and you live your life as if God does not exist, there is a disdain and a dehumanization of other people that come in as part of that worldview. What we need to understand is that the world of atheism that has basically said there is no God has led to the murder of more people than all the other world religions combined. People are so apt to say, what about Islam and what about radical Christianity? So many people have died at the hands of those people. I'm going to tell you, that's true, but none more have died than at the hands of atheistic regimes. Because when you forget about God, there is no value for life. When you forget about God, there is no problem with war and violence to to, uh, eradicate a lesser species of of human beings. The Nazis, same one. Boy, I talk about conversations with the kids at the dinner table. I'm not even going to go into that. Nothing like having dinner with the kids talking about Nazis and, and Hitler. It's a great, great dinner table conversation. There's a disregard for accountability to God that seeks to elevate ourselves and put ourselves on equal standing with Him. And then there's a disregard for human life. Look what Edom's guilty of, verse 10. Because of the violence to your brother Jacob, you will be covered with shame and you will be cut off forever for why you stood aloof when they were being attacked by the, by the Babylonians. See, there's a sin of ignoring. They should have stepped in to help. They should have stepped in and said, you know what, 800 years of violence, 800 years of hostility, 800 years of conflict, you know what, they're being ransacked right now, and yet they did not step in and help out at all. They ignored the problem. As a matter of fact, if you remember Amos chapter 1, the issue with with Edom from Amos in verse 11, he says, you stood by and you stifled your compassion and your anger raged continually that it was left unchecked and you didn't help them. So they ignored a brother in need. They were were guilty of the sin of rejoicing. Not only did they ignore the problem, they delighted in and rejoiced over Israel's misfortune. Now let's be honest. Have you not had an enemy... Where when something negative happens to them, inside your heart you're going... If you think about the things you've experienced, offenses committed against you by somebody you thought was your friend, maybe a loved one, maybe a, maybe a... But wasn't there something inside of your heart that when you heard of some sort of misfortune, inside you secretly applauded? I have. I've done that. And how quick God is to convict that spirit. The Bible rejoice with those who rejoice. You weep with those who weep. We are not to derive from another person's failure. Yes, it, it, it's a cover for soothing our, in, our inadequacies, isn't it? To, to applaud someone else's misfortune makes us feel better, right? But the moment you start elevating yourself, where does that get you? To the level of pride and not down to the level of Proverbs 24, do not gloat when your enemy falls. When he stumbles, do not let your heart rejoice or you will see the Lord and experience his disapproval. Proverbs 24. There's the sin of assisting. So not only did they ignore, not only did they get out of sin, but they assisted. Look what it says. Verse... 13, do not enter the gate of my people in the day of their disaster. Do not gloat over their calamity in the day of their disaster. Do not loot their wealth. See, not only did they help somebody that they should, should have been helping, they assisted the enemy by turning over captives. They stood in the road, and if anyone tried to run, they grabbed them and turned them over, either to be in prison or slain. And once they turned them over to the enemy... They went in and they looted for themselves. 
They assisted the enemy. They assisted themselves. Second Chronicles 19 says, Should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord and so bring wrath on yourself from him? What does Jesus say regarding the treatment of those who may be our enemies? You love those who persecute you. Pray for your enemies. You develop a heart that says, I want good for you. Even though you may not give it back to me. Because as a follower of Jesus, you are called to act and be like Jesus. You are not responsible for what's reciprocated. Lastly, the sin of rejecting. Verse 15. God says, my patience will eventually come to an end. We rejoice in the patience of God. Romans chapter 2. It's His kindness. It is His patience that has led to repentance, right? The fact that we're still alive here. Amen. The fact that we are still here able to hear God's voice, to awaken our hearts to the fact that He loves us and He wants what's best for us. Thank God for His patience. Amen? But His patience will come to an end when it comes to the nations of the world that continue to reject Him. Patience will come to an end against those who have rejected Him in their lives. And God says in verse 15 and 16, For the day of the Lord draws near on all nations. No one is immune. And so He says, It is time to seek the Lord while He may be found. It is time to call upon His name while He is near. Isaiah chapter 55. Because He says, The way you have treated others is going to come back to you. This, this is the negative of the, of the golden rule, right? Jesus said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Well, this is the, the converse of that. He says, I will judge you in the judgment. I will use against you is the exact way you've treated other people. Everything you've done, eat them. I'm going to bring it right back to you in judgment. Which now brings us to our last point. The hope of deliverance. I don't know if you guys heard uh, about the the... I-5 Seattle, major traffic jam this past week on the freeway. People in traffic, not moving for hours, right? Well, after a little bit of time had gone on, there's this, in the middle of traffic, this taco truck that's there in the middle of the, the, the freeway. And they decided, you know what, we're not going anywhere. People are hungry. They opened up for business in the middle of the interstate. What I love about this story is that, you know what, yeah, they're, they're doing business, right? They're selling tacos. There's a party on I-5 in Seattle, and they've turned a situation into something positive, right? Praise God, taco trucks, right? Boy, I'm really hungry for Taco El Pastor right now. <laughs> but what's cool is, you know what, we, we're living in some negative situations, negative times. We can look out and be pessimistic. But you know what, this message is the taco truck part of Obadiah's message to us. Okay? You, you ready for something like, you know, you know, things could be worse, right? There's a message of hope here in Obadiah. And it's regarding two things, deliverance and inheritance. Look at these last verses and consider these wonderful, wonderful truths. Because what we find in these verses is what I mentioned early on in the message. Two men, Jacob and Esau, started two people groups, Israel and Edom. But these two groups are really symbolic of two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of God, and then there's the kingdoms of these world, this world. One kingdom of this world will eventually be destroyed. Because here's the question to you, where are the Edomites today? They're gone. They were destroyed over a period of time and ultimately finally destroyed at AD 70 when the Roman army came in. There is no more Edom. And you can say that about a lot of nations. No more this, there's no more that. Why? Is because there's only one kingdom that will last forever. And that's the kingdom of Christ. Obadiah finishes and says, Mount Zion will be that place. The Lord's holy hill will be that place for those who escape. And it's going to be holy. And the house of Jacob will have its inheritance there with all his possessions. And what the Obadiah wants to remind the people of is that God is a God who will deliver and a God is a God who will, will return to you everything that you have lost. And I'm not going to say it's a dollar for dollar or, or item by item type thing, but there's going to be such joy in our deliverance and in our inheritance. You will not lack anything 
in God's love. He says, judgment is coming. And finally, he finishes in verse 21 that the kingdom will be the Lord's. God will deliver. See, in immediate context, 70 years later, Israel will be allowed to go back and rebuild its city and its walls. This is where the the account of Nehemiah and Ezra comes in, if you want to read those. The, The fact that they were in captivity in Babylon for 70 years and eventually they were set free. But you know what, again, there's somewhat limiting in in our understanding of, well, okay, they were still set free, but Israel still had enemies. I to do, and I close with this. I want you to consider the greatest conflict between the, the, the line of Jacob and the line of Esau. And I want you to think about a guy by the name of Herod the Great, who was an Edomite. And when he heard that there was going to be a king going to be born, that would challenge his throne, what did he set out to do? I'm going to kill all the children born under the age of two. And he laid waste to who knows how many countless number of innocent little baby boys. But eventually, Herod the Great would die. And yet he would not kill the one who was from the line of Jacob. Did you know Jesus is from the line of Jacob? And then Herod's son would step up. And he would stand with Jesus toe to toe and say, teach me all your wonderful philosophy. Well, here's this man from the line of Jacob named Jesus in tattered clothing, in sandals, with no pedigree that would be esteemed by the world. And he stood across from this Herod who had a legacy and an ancestry of royalty and power and riches. And yet this man, Herod, would eventually lose the ultimate battle, die of a disease in a foreign land, and this poor prince named Jesus would be turned over, tried, crucified, buried, but rise again on the third day. You see what happens when the line of Edom tries to take over the kingdom of God? The kingdom of God will never be usurped. It will never be destroyed. It will never be conquered. The line of Jacob lives on in the personal work of Jesus Christ. And when Jesus establishes his kingdom, it will be eternal, it will be everlasting, and it will forever be victorious. God says, don't challenge me. Humble yourself. Be broken at the feet of this King Jesus. Find eternal life in Him. If you go the way of the Herods, you can do that, but it will ultimately lead to destruction. But if you bow humbly before the almighty power of God displayed in Jesus, you will be delivered. You will have an inheritance laid up for you in heaven. You will live forever with joy and peace with the God who is choosing to say, you are now my child. Choose the kingdom. Which one will you follow? But remember the words of James. He opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. It doesn't matter who you are or where you've been. God's love wants to take over your life. The world may not think you're worthy, but God has chosen you to hear this message today. Because he wants you to know, he wants you to be a part of his kingdom. It's like Gary from Chicago. You guys know Gary from Chicago? He was the guy that was on on the Oscars last Sunday night. Remember when they brought the tour bus in? Knew what was going on? And there's Gary out front like, hey! He's kissing, you know, Nicole Kidman on the hand. And Denzel stands up and does a little marriage impromptu thing. And Gary from Chicago! And all of a sudden, the Twitterverse started lighting up like, oh, Gary, he's such a likable person, right? Think about what lies in store for Gary, who inadvertently ended up at the Kodak Theater and watch, being watched by millions and millions and millions of people. Well, it wasn't shortly after Gary from Chicago popped up and became kind of the, 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 the darling of the entertainment world for 15 minutes that all of a sudden, Gary's track record, his life came to surface. In petty robbery, in jail for drug possession, in jail for attempted rape. All of a sudden, Gary from Chicago is no longer a darling. And he went crashing down like that. And how easy it is for this world to exalt you and to praise you and to honor you, but when they really find out what you're made out of, they're going to destroy you. 
And there is no such destruction when it comes to the love of God in Jesus Christ. Because he knows your past, he knows your present, he knows your future, and he says to you, I love you nonetheless. Walk with me, let me be your everything, let me be your hope, and be a part of a kingdom that will never be destroyed, but will last forever. Who's in? (laughs) I'm in. I pray you're in. God's good, is he not? Obadiah. Who would ever thought, right? Awesome, awesome words. Father, we are before you humbled by the fact that you would meet us in this place. Humbled by the fact that we could read this message and, and, and be challenging, convicted at parts where, where yes, we are guilty of, of trusting in things that, that don't involve you. And, and probably the most egregious sin is we have tried to live our lives completely apart or devoid of you. Help us return to the place where we have abandoned and the hope that is rooted in Christ is restored. That there's no kingdom more important than your kingdom and there's no possession worth our time and our energies than the possession of eternal life that is given to us as a gift through Jesus. Help us do battle with inward pride and continues to show the way of humility. Who, like Jesus, considered his riches as nothing, but considered his submissive service to you everything. Thank you that we who are in Christ have bowed to the King of all kings. And because we know the King of all kings, we are part of a kingdom that will never be destroyed but last forever. Thank you for that. Remind us of our future. Remind us of our ultimate deliverance. Remind us of the inheritance that is laid up for the saints that is imperishable and that will last for eternity. You are awesome, God. Deserving of all praise and worship and adoration. And we pray this in the mighty and glorious and beautiful name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand. Closing benediction. How's that for a good word? May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord continue to lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. God bless you guys. Have a great day. Norm's, yeah, if you need prayer, Norm is available. He's going to be right over here. You guys have a great week. We'll see you soon, right?